Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a CastBox original produced in partnership with our friends at Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, and all of your favorite podcasts are there, ripe for the downloading. Sacred Symbols is available wherever you get your podcasts, of course, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot. We think it's pretty rad. To get each episode of Sacred Symbols three days before the public, completely ad-free, please consider supporting the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. Perks for support include not only getting the show early and ad-free, but you can also gain access to monthly exclusive podcasts, and supporting on Patreon is the only way to get your listener mail read on the air, and much more. Plus, supporting Sacred Symbols on Patreon also nets you perks for other Collins Last Stand shows automatically, including the Nostalgia and Retro Podcast Knockback, the YouTube series dedicated to gaming called SideQuest, and the eclectic interview podcast Fireside Chats. Thank you for your generosity, kindness, and support. Without you, Sacred Symbols and all things Collins Last Stand would not exist. But enough of that. On to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode 43. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by a very good man, Chris Raygun. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. You're very svelte today. Very what? Svelte. Svelte? Yeah. What is that? It's a word that means that you look very, very fit, very buff. I don't like that word. No? You don't no. Want to enjoy that word? I don't like S's followed by V's at the beginning of words. Right. right. That's very specifically my phobia. I understand. Whoa. That's an interesting phobia. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like weird collections and amalgamations of vowels. I don't like weird collections or amalgamations of consonants. You see it in Eastern Europe a lot. There are a lot of Wales. These weird combinations. I don't. Wales is a mess. I don't know. <laughs> Wales is a disaster. I also don't appreciate whales in the ocean, and I don't like whales the place in the UK. Oh, that's two for two at right. that point. Because the, the, the Welsh people, fine people, can't really understand what they're saying. Actually, we have a little bit of something we're going to get into in a little while. Some British, some of the British audience had a really big problem with the way I said a specific word. Yeah, and I have, a, just I so have f- a problem with their problem. I have a problem with their problem, too, because they're wrong. But we're yeah. going to get to that. <laughs> we'll get to it, yeah. We're going to get to that in a little while. For the uninitiated, Sacred Symbols is our weekly PlayStation podcast. You can get every episode three days early without ads by supporting us over on Patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand, like thousands of the listeners do of this very podcast. Or I should say thousands of listeners of this podcast. Yeah. Because otherwise, and in thousands of the listeners is not really doesn't really sound good. I mean, we're we're no. trying to tell the British how to speak English, and I'm I'm over here really flubbing <laughs> yeah, through the did lines. Make a, did make a good case, which is a which is a bit of a problem. You can also submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas to the show. We read a bunch of them every week by supporting us on Patreon. Patreon is also the place where you get exclusive podcasts, etc. If you have some disposable income, you like our show, please consider giving us a few bucks over there a month. It helps us to continue to do this show and the other shows that I do as well. If you want to be freeloaders, that's perfectly fine. Leave us nice reviews. Tell your friends, family, but not your enemies about the might, the majesty and the wonder of the world's most beloved PlayStation podcast. Sacred Symbols. Uncontested. Yeah, I don't actually think there's any contest at all. I don't think anyone would even (laughs) say otherwise. Now, Chris. Yeah. There are a few things we need to get into before we get into the news. Some serious things that I want to talk about, etc. I think that we're going to mainly structure this episode around kind of following up with the PlayStation 5 information from last week. The audience has a lot to talk about. Pretty light week otherwise. So we'll see as we get through it. But the audience wrote in with a few things that we need to touch on here and there as we get into this week's episode. Joseph LaRussa wrote into us on Patreon. He said, hey, gents, rather than doing a Days Gone spoiler chat with non-spoilers in the beginning, why not just talk about it the week after as well, briefly giving your review style impressions and will you do a Days Gone review? So this is relevant because I kind of struggled with this. We're both playing Days Gone. We both had it for actually a long time. Yeah. By the time this podcast goes live for public audiences outside of Patreon, we would actually have been allowed to talk about it. So the answer we had to come up with, Chris, is should we have delayed the podcast in order to have Days Gone coverage? And my answer to that is no, because I don't know that I necessarily need to wedge Days Gone into a normal episode. Days Gone is such an important game to the audience that I think what I want to do, and I'm curious if you feel like this, is we've done spoiler casts, so-called spoiler casts and discussions around games for two games so far. We did it for Red Dead, and we, before that, we did it for Spider-Man. So we're always going to do it for these big releases. I would have loved to do one for Sekiro, but I just didn't play it at the time. Yeah. And so what I'm wondering, Chris, is should we, for this game, do a separate podcast 
that will go live next week sometime. We'll record it next week, maybe right after we do the re- regular podcast. That is both a review discussion and a spoiler cast for Days Gone. I mean, I feel like we we could probably make that work. I don't see why not. I mean, those kinds of spoiler casts always kind of end up being kind of first impressions or kind of reviews anyway. Right. We, we do kind of talk about how we feel about them, and especially because we're not going to be able to for a while. We might, we might as well just touch on it. But I don't know. I don't see why we should call it like a review spoiler cast or anything like that. Okay, so... But you're of the mind that we could do a Days Gone episode. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think as well. I think we'll do that as well. That way, like we can spend more than an hour or so talking about the game. It's such an important game and a game we've been waiting for for such a long time. And this audience has been waiting for. So to Joseph's point, I think we're going to do something kind of similar to what you talk about here. Instead of we'll just we'll just talk about the game and we're going to include a bunch of your letters in your comments. So that will go live next week. When the thread for episode 44 goes live on Patreon to get your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts and ideas. And I will make a parallel thread for Days Gone. This won't give you much time because Days Gone will have come up out the day that this thread goes live. Yeah. But at least give you the weekend to play the game and submit your thoughts. And then we can include you in that podcast. So that's what we're going to do a week from today. We're going to record it. And so a week from when this episode goes live, we'll put it live maybe or maybe we'll hold it till Friday. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Sounds good, though. Yeah. Connor Peterman wrote into us. He said, hey, guys, considering you have to spend an excess of $1,000 on the graphics card alone to run games at 8K 30 frames per second on PC, I can guarantee the PS5 will not play games at 8K if they want that under $599 price point. Console hardware has pretty much always been in the shadow of PCs, so I don't see how that would change this generation. What they probably are talking about is 8K streaming, similar to how the Xbox One S can stream 4K video. Take it easy, gents, and keep making Tuesdays great. Connor's writing in because we talked about PlayStation 5 last week. And in there, we had noted that Mark Cerny had discussed about how there was going to be 8K playback or 8K possibilities on the console. We got quite a bit of feedback saying that that's probably not in relation to video games. Yeah. Because it's probably not going to be possible. Probably not. I, I, I could see them maybe doing some checkerboarding 8K upscaling. I don't think we're going to be seeing true 8K in video games on the next generation of consoles. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably I think they're probably right. Why Probably would you is. even want 8K resolution when the TVs necessary to display it are probably so expensive right yeah, now? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, eventually they won't be. Right. That's kind of the idea. It's like future proofing. Uh, 4K TVs are pretty cheap now, whereas like a couple of years ago they were fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I still so don't have like, them. And they're, they're nice. I, I would prefer, I, I think, 4K 60. I, I would say focus on frame rate more than resolution. I could give less of a shit about resolution, honestly, as long as the games run well. I'm, I'm of the same mind, I, although... You're more of a frame rate guy. Like, I don't really have a problem with 30 frames. I don't mind 30 frames. I mind inconsistent frames. Like, I don't mind having it locked at 30 frames and it's a smooth 30 frames. It's like, okay, good. At least it's consistent and it's not jittery or frustrating to look at. But most games that are 30 frames dip constantly and it's just this weird kind of like feeling of like trudging through sand sometimes. And it's just like, I don't know. If we can get like a a base, because 60 is objectively better. Like, objectively. Like, I don't think anybody could really argue. But it's the consistency of that frame rate that matters more than the actual the actual frame rate. Sure. I think we'll probably experience much steadier and much higher frame rates along with better resolutions with the next console. But we'll have to wait and see for sure. Adam Johnson wrote into us on Patreon. They said, hello, Chris and Colin. I've been a longtime follower of yourself, Colin, since 2013 and a supporter over on Patreon for some time now. But I haven't felt the need to comment on your fine work you've been doing all these years. But one thing you both said during the drop last week has compelled me to write in now. I know I'm going to get told to shut up, you fucking nerd, but as an Englishman, I couldn't let it slide. So here it goes. Snooker is pronounced snooker, like snooker, uh. not snow. And he says snooker, but that's not how he said it. Also, the World Snooker Championships happened this weekend, which may also explain why the games both came out at the same time. Blah, blah, blah. So we'll talk about that later. But Adam, a lot of people wrote in. A lot of people felt the need to write in about this. That's not how it's spelled. No, first <laughs> of all, it's not how it's spelled. spelled. And they're also just wrong. So I went on Cambridge, the Cambridge Dictionary from your, you know, you you lobster backs, your, your wonderful <laughs> Cambridge Univer- Univer- University, right? Great college. Here's how they say you say it in British. Let me see if I have. Right. Yeah, so here's how they say you say it in British. Snooker. All right, so that's how you guys say it in Britain. It says in American English, the real English. Snooker. Yeah, well, look, look, look at that. How it's spelled. Whoa, what a surprise. But anyway, you guys are wrong. So I'm glad that you guys all took a lot of time out of your old days to tell me how to speak English. (laughs) 
I don't I don't like the the, the idea that like we're saying it wrong just because it's spelled the way like it's spelled that way. Yeah, it's spelled snook, snooker. Snook. Hey, what are you doing? Ooh, snooker. Oh, oh you bloody pl- hell! You're Fuck playing off. a little snook. Yeah, you're right, cunt. <laughs> you right, cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I have so I have too many British friends. So I appreciate you writing in, all of you who wrote in about this, but you're wrong. And I know that that's really hard for you to deal with because you went out of your way. You thought you were being like real fucking clever, right? <laughs> you guys were being like, oh, we got Colin and we got Colin in a little bit of a bind now. <laughs> we're gonna uh, fit. Uh, we uh, can't keep doing these British a accents. A, a, bit of a, a bit of a bind. Oh, that's bad. That was a bad one. That wasn't that was a good one? That was, that was too cockney. Oh, okay. That was, that was <laughs> extreme. It sounded like I was in a Guy Ritchie movie. It sounded like a fable game. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you guys for writing into us and being wrong. We appreciate you. We still love you over in Britain, but when we took English back from you guys, <laughs> we made it better. We don't, you know, just put your use in your random words and make it really complicated how you say everything. That's totally fine, right? Yeah, yeah. You're free to do that. Whatever it's you want. It's a free country here. Maybe not there. We have a free country. I can't speak for if you guys have as free of a country as we do. Moise Khan wrote into us and said, hey, CNC, not a question. More of a PSA for the audience about PSN name changes. YouTuber Mystic, who you gave a shout out to a few weeks ago for the Vita video, did a test to see how PSN name changes would affect PS3 and Vita, which are officially not supported for name changes as per Sony. In short, most games either handled it properly with some really old online games facing loss of progress, which was recovered on changing back to the old name. However, one game, Black Ops 2, bricked his PS3 and corrupted his hard drive when he tried playing it after the name change. So fair warning to the people who still play on PS3 to be wary when changing their PSN name. So uh, this is the disappointing thing, if there is a disappointing thing about learning more about PlayStation 5 last week, is that we finally got PSN name changes and the opportunity to structure an entire episode around it. And we couldn't. Yeah. Because even bigger news happened. But Uh. the PSN name changes are trudging on. People are finding most success in it. There are interesting websites that tra- track all the games that work and don't work. So I just want to let you guys know this is still happening. Keep an eye on things. If for some reason you're playing Black Ops 2 on PS3 still, might not want to change your name. Sounds like. Yeah, that's a, that's a weird that's a weird game to still be playing on PS3. Yeah, I think it's still a, I think it's somewhat of a weird game to still be playing. Generally speaking, well, I mean those older Call of Duty games are just rife with hackers now, especially because they're just so abandoned by the de- by the uh, the devs. So like I don't know, I don't even know how that's how that's fun. No, I don't either. But to each his own. Just wanted to throw that warning out there. Now, Chris, I want to talk about something serious for just a few moments, if you don't mind, before we move into our next phase here. So I was contacted by a listener of this show a few months ago. His name is Ben. He works at a company in the UK called Charlie Cohen. Charlie Cohen, it's Charlie without an E, Cohen. So it's C-H-A-R-L-I Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. And they're like a high-end, sophisticated clothing company, things that... I look at their store. I'm like, I, you, I can't wear this stuff. I, I wear T-shirts and jeans. I would look like, you know, a fool trying to look fashionable. Right. But they make like really high fashion stuff. And this guy reached out to me because they're doing an initiative at this company called Shades of Blue. That is this initiative that they're doing with kind of a cross section of blogging and podcasting and kind of just self-awareness and general awareness of mental health, anxiety, depression, et cetera, specifically in the creative fields. And specifically in like fields where people are artists or they're photographers or they're programmers or whatever. People that like you and I make things for a living. And by that, I mean makes, you know, creative art or some sort of entertainment, not like a house or something. Yeah. Like yeah. And as in, I think many fields, these, this is a field we can relate to, but there's a there's a bit of a a tragic kind of swelling of anxiety and depression in the way people are dealing with social media and the way people are dealing with the creation and and the response to their art and all the other things, just kind of the the general weight that people like you and I feel on a daily basis. And you and I are both openly anxious and openly depressed people. Yeah. In fact, we both go to the same psychiatrist, which is fun. <laughs> so Ben reached out to me. He's a fan and he saw, thought, could we collaborate in some way? Because he knows that I'm really open about my my anxiety and my depression and stuff like that. And I think it's really important that we remain open about these things to de- continue to destigmatize them and to continue to send people in the right direction, right? It wasn't until I was 33 that I went and actually tried to solve my problem for the first time. I just lived with it for a really long time. And yeah, it ravaged my stomach and my colon and made my life way harder than it had to be. And people reached out and tried to help, but I just didn't have the right resources or whatever. So basically what we're doing here, and, and I think this is a little bit of a fun initiative, is we're doing something that is basically Colin's last stand cross Charlie Cohen, but to support Shades of Blue... I did an interview with them for their very first Shades of Blue podcast all about my own mental tribulations. 
And in that interview, which I'm going to link out on Patreon, we'll get into that in a second. I talk about how I look at my life as a checklist. I look at my life as like a Ubisoft checklist, right? And get this done, check the box, do this, check the box, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so they made a patch, like this really cool patch that you can just put on a piece of clothing or a backpack or just stick on a on a bulletin board or whatever the case might be. That is like a CLS cross Charlie Cohen patch of like anxiety things that we deal with. It's kind of just an ode to right. the mental feelings that we all feel. Right. And the idea is that you can go to their website and for sixteen dollars a patch with free shipping. They're in the, they're in Britain with free shipping. They will send you this patch, physical patch that you can do whatever you want with. And all of the money, all $16, or I guess, you know, above and beyond what it costs to make. But all of the, the revenue goes towards building out, continuing to buff out and continue to kind of make better this this Shades of Blue initiative that they're trying to put into the world. And so I thought this was a really cool way that we can collaborate with another totally different company that has nothing to do with us, basically, in a way that brings awareness towards the stigmatization of mental health and the importance of mental health and all of those other things by routing it through our reality here on Sacred Symbols and our reality about the way we talk about it on Collins Last Stand. Right. Does that all sure. that make sense so far? I think it makes sense, yeah. I think it's funny that, that we just spent like an entire question making fun of British people. Yeah, that's <laughs> and fine. And we're working with a London-based yeah, company. Yeah, we're, we're working with a London-based company. Now, these are really nice people over there. I really encourage you guys to go listen to the interview. And if you have the extra money, go buy a patch. They'll ship it again for free and that money will go towards making this initiative better. And and hopefully helping a bunch of people. So here's what I'm gonna do to make this really easy. The second that this goes live, concurrent to this podcast going live on Patreon, I'm gonna put a post up on Patreon at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. It'll be free. You do not have to be a subscriber to read it. You do not have to give us any money to partake. It'll just be there. It's basically where I own web space and I can like do shit, right? right? So I'm gonna put it up there. I'm gonna put a link to the store where you can look into this patch if you want to. I'm gonna put a link to the interview where you can listen to my interview with them about my own mental tribulations and my own kind of depression and anxiety. Hopefully you guys find that useful or interesting. And if you want to buy the patch, you can. I get no money out of it. I don't benefit at all. They are going to send me patches in the future that we will probably give away on Patreon later on. But for right now, this is the way we're going to do it. And hopefully we can raise a little bit of money for them to, you know, continue to do what I think is a really positive initiative. Yeah, for sure. So I wanted to throw that out there. So again, go to patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. It does not matter if you support me or not. You will be able to read more about this, get the links again to all the pertinent details. And we appreciate our friends over at Charlie Cohen for thinking of working with us on this initiative. And hopefully we can continue to do it into the future because I really do think it's important that we can continue to talk about these things and that we can continue to, to generate more positivity in such a negative creative space. So there's that. Mm -hmm. Now, Chris, we're playing Days Gone. Yeah. Still can't talk about it. Damn. Are you playing anything else? Did you play no, Dreams? I didn't. I didn't play Dreams. I kind of. I totally forgot that it was out. Yeah. <laughs> I completely forgot about it. But I've been. I've been just focusing on on Days Gone and like working. Right. So like, right. Right. You know. And I want to get. I want to get through it as much of it as possible. So I just have a lot to say about it. I already have a lot to say about it. I think we both do. Yeah. I have a shit ton of notes. And yeah, you and I have been going back and forth about it too. Yeah. So, so it, it should be a fun. When we finally get to talk about it, I'm sure we'll, it'll be a nice little cathartic dump of information yeah it's gonna be awesome i'm really excited to, to tell you guys more about the game i'm also playing cuphead mm -hmm. just throwing that out there i bought it on switch i played it just for like less than an hour it's really good I, i've just been distracted with other stuff but it's really really quite charming and there's no surprise about that yeah. i also bought the konami arcade collection that just kind of quietly came out with like twin b and you know salamander and shit on it it's just old arcade games but otherwise yeah mostly days gone and again we can't talk about it yet but kyle tisdell did write into us on Patreon, he says, hey, Christ and Colin the Impaler. I know neither of you are particularly interested in playing it. Well, Chris kind of well, that's is. not true. Yeah, I, I am. But I just wanted to confirm with you guys after playing the Dreams Early Access for the last few days that the game is absolutely fantastic. It's incredibly intuitive and more in-depth than I could ever fathom, with probably the best tutorials ever made. It's also drenched in absolute British charm. It's really, truly a joy to play, and I have a hard time believing it could possibly be the end of Media Molecule. Sure, it's niche. Not a lot of people knew about it, and Sony seems not to give a shit about it at all. But from a sheer quality standpoint, it's miles above any other creation game ever made, and I have a feeling that will speak to enough people to keep the studio afloat. I hope at least one of you guys can try it out soon, as I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. It looks like Chris will be the one that tries it for us, and we will have yeah. thoughts on that in the coming weeks. Yeah, no, for sure. I've seen I've seen people do some crazy shit in it already. Like, I saw somebody recreate uh, the f intro level of Silent Hill 2 almost. It, I couldn't even tell which one was the original. It's actually wild. It's pretty cool. So it should be... Seems uh, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how intuitive it'll be, but I'm excited to get my hands on it. I've always, I've always really liked creation games and games with creation as aspects to them. Cool. So Chris will have thoughts in the coming weeks, and I wanted to read Kyle's letter just 
because I think that I particularly have been hard on dreams. And so I want to just represent the other side that this game is out. It's being enjoyed by people. And my hope is that Media Molecule more than survives this uh, this well, ordeal. Well, it's also just yeah. not being talked about because they're, Sony's just burying it. Right. That's the major thing is that I, I just think that's strange. Like, why would you release it now? Yeah, it's weird. I After all this time, it's not a shit or get off the pot situation anymore. So you could have just held it. And yeah, and it's interfering with Days Gone. And they're like really going crazy with the Days Gone ads and stuff like that. So Dreams is just, I'd be mad if I was at Media Molecule. I'd be pretty bummed. No, yeah, for sure. You know, they're, they're kind of I don't, I don't think it's it. very fair. Those are the two studios, I think, that are mo most on the chopping block. And so it's interesting that their games are being released at the same time. Yeah, and they both cater to completely different audiences. Yeah, hopefully they both survive. Chris, let's get into the news. All righty. Number one. Last week, we discussed at length Wired's interview with Sony's Mark Cerny, which is where we received the first on-the-record confirmed details of Sony's next-gen console, which we're calling PlayStation 5, though Sony has yet to, to say the console's name. Can you imagine if it's not PlayStation 5? That'd I could imagine weird. that. Yeah. You could? Yeah. I can't I can't fathom. I just I, I would it would be surprising to me, especially after the PS4 thing, which we talked about last week, but PlayStation Nova. I always thought like when PS4 was being revealed in late twenty twelve, early twenty thirteen, my theory at the time, which was not a good theory, was like they're gonna call it PlayStation. And I think eventually they're gonna do that. I think eventually it's just gonna be like this think, is the PlayStation. I think probably eventually. Yeah, you know, and Maybe. so I wonder if this is the console where they're gonna be like, This is called a PlayStation. We'll see. And it's gonna be I would call a PlayStation, it would be super modular, and it would never go away, and it would be awesome. But what do I know about literally anything like that? Nothing at all. So here we go. However, the story's author, Peter Rubin, tweeted out an unused segment of the interview that may speak to what the console ultimately costs. And by the way, I thought it was really weird and peculiar that he left this out of his piece. This is actually really interesting. Yeah. Rubin asked Cerny about the traditional range of console pricing at launch, and if PS5 will be in that range. Cerny answered, quote, I believe that we will be able to release it at a price that will be appealing to gamers in light of its advanced feature set, Ooh. end quote. When Ruben followed up inquiring on if Cerny is saying it'll actually cost a bit more than we expect, quote, but what you're getting is well worth it. So that's from Ruben. Cerny briefly answered, quote, that's about all I can say. Oh, end man. Quote. I feel nostalgic about that. I don't know that this is a great sign. Oh, no. If, if you if. I'm 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 hearing 599 US dollars. Yeah, I'm hearing I'm, I'm hearing at least 500 from this. I don't know if that's true or not. I think that he could be being cagey because they don't know. I mean, the box might not even be done yet. You know, and they, yeah, it might not sure. even literally be put together yet, considering it's not going to be out for a while. They're obviously specking all these games. I mean, I know that they're specking them on on PCs, yeah. or at least they have been. No, for sure. But what does this what does this mean to you? This was a real again. I don't understand why this was left out of the article. This is a really yeah. important piece of information. It's probably the most interesting part of it. Honestly. Again, Cerny says, quote, I believe that we will be able to release it at a price that will be appealing to gamers in light of its advanced feature set. End quote. I think 500 minimum. Yeah, I think minimum. So but I'm I'm betting I'm be I'm betting 599 US dollars. Oh, man. That maybe maybe even 550. You know? Yeah. I, just because of the for a long time, PlayStation fans, 599 US dollars is a, is a literal ver vernacular throwback to PS3's yeah. launch window. And I wonder if because of that, if they even just stay away from that number. Like, even if it's, like you said, 549.99 yeah. or 579.99 or 539 or 529, 500. I don't know if they would do 599 just because that would invoke <laughs> that memory, which yeah. is not a good memory. No, for sure. But I definitely think it's going to be over 500 if, if they're talking about that, because I think the Xbox One X was, I think, five, if I'm not mistaken. Might have been four, but still, like, I can't imagine it's like 500 seems about right. Yeah, it's, it's what they're saying. They wouldn't they wouldn't say in light of its advanced future set if it wasn't a high price. Right. Strange answer. Really strange that Ruben left that out of his piece, too, I thought. But that's the one new piece of PS5 information we have. But a lot of people obviously wrote into us, Chris, on Patreon sure. to talk about this. So I thought we would go in. We, I wrote down five of their questions, actually. And let's go through them. All right. And see what they have to say. Isaac Sinova wrote into us and said, hey, Sanguine Colin and extra Chris. The PS5 details came out in an interview, and while all of the shiny newness and future-proofing has me excited, it also has me concerned about a significantly increased price point. Considering all that the developer says the PS5 will entail, what do you envision the entries unit price point will be, considering the likely, considering they likely want a portion of their sizable PS4 audience to make the leap with them and upgrade? Thanks for all the brain candy. I wanted to bring, I, we just talked a little bit about what Isaac had, had mentioned, but I specifically wanted to talk about his thing about the portion of the PS4 audience upgrading. I wonder if we're getting multiple consoles from them. How do you get PS4 audiences happy with their console to invest in something really expensive? That's the major problem. PS4 was so attractive because it was cheap. It was 400 bucks. That's not an expensive, you know, console really uh, in 2013, especially compared to a $500 Xbox One at the time. Yeah. So how do you feel about this particular question? Like, 
how do you feel like Sony is going to be able to pull people from PS4 if the console is expensive? I don't know. I mean, every, every generation, you have people, you have early adopters, you have people making the Switch anyway all the time regardless. So, like, I mean, what was the last generation? How long did that last? Like eight, seven years? The PS3, Xbox 360 generation lasted from 2005 to 2013. So eight years. But Yeah, and people left from those. Right. I don't see, I don't know. I, I don't see this as a huge issue. Like, I, I imagine anybody who's super excited about the next wave of technology is going to be onto it. And that's a lot of people involved in the game space. I don't think they're going to have a tough time uh, getting new people on uh, as long as the feature set and the, the console is enticing. I hope not. You know, I was at my brother's house in Philly, you know, a couple months ago and his wife was using, they have like a PS4, a PS3, a Wii U, a Switch. They have like a lot of shit for them and their son, and their son and their yeah. daughter. And she was watching Netflix on PS3. And I was like, why would you even, she, you know, she's a layman she uh, with this stuff. And uh, so right. she doesn't know any better, but I'm like, why would you subject yourself to this console? Like that's like, because <laughs> you have to update it and everything, all that kind of stuff. So with PS4, it being so attractive at the time, I think was, partially driven by the fact that the, the consoles we were playing, I was not sad. I was not really satisfied with the PS3. It was fine, you know? And I don't think people were really that satisfied with the Xbox 360. I think that we have a level of deep satisfaction with these new consoles, at least I do, in their functionality and in the way that they act and in the way that they can do a bunch of different things that I'm a hardcore gamer, but if I was a casual gamer, I would have no need to upgrade. And I think that that's a yeah. difference. I think that there was kind of some sort of latent need to upgrade. Back in the but day, there that doesn't is, exist now. But there is a difference in the way we approach new technology now, whereas, like, back in the day, people weren't getting new phones all the time. And, like, we're just kind of used to this kind of progressive upgrading, I don't know, cycle that we're in now. Like, our phones are obsolete in, like, a year. It's, like, ridiculous. And in 2013, that necessarily wasn't, like, we our phones were shitty, but we didn't... I, I feel like it wasn't the same kind of... Even in the console space, like you PS4 Pro, Xbox One X, uh, here's a new S Pro Switch that's rumored to come out. You know, this is a very new thing, and I feel like people are just more used to just kind of, oh, it's a new cycle, all right, I'll get the new thing. I don't know, I feel like people aren't really thinking that much about it. We'll see. Yeah, we're going to see how it all plays out. I'm really excited about all these questions, though. These things that we don't know about and how it's all going to play, good or bad. You know, I'm just a, I'm just an observer. I really don't have a horse in this race. I really, I, I would like to see the new PlayStation do well, but I'm not sure that I really care. You know, like, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to play it. So it doesn't matter if yeah, it no, sells exactly. like 10 I'm, million. I'm super interested to just see where everything goes. I think people are a little too invested in these machines sometimes, I guess, is the point. I love PlayStation, but I, I really don't feel like I am jockeying at all to like, you know, to I love Vita and no one cared about it. So it's not like it's going to be like a different thing. If, if it's yeah. good, it's good. And if it's bad, it's bad. And how it does is not super relevant to me, apart from a, just an observer of the industry, I guess. But yeah. we must talk about these questions. Boxcar wrote into us, said, what's up, fellas? Do you guys think Sony's conservative approach to the PS5 is making itself stand out from the competition? Both Microsoft and Google seem focused on streaming. Nintendo is doing its own thing, like always. Sony seems to be saying here is your next-gen console. It'll play all the games you love and be more powerful. I personally like it. I think most gamers, at least the hardcore, are conservative with their gaming. They want better experiences and not all the gimmicks. They just give us a powerful box that can play fun, engaging games. Thanks. This is another interesting thing. Do you think that they're setting themselves up to just do again, Chris, what they did last time, which was to say, like, these are all distractions. Our system is powerful and it plays video games. I think so. I think that's probably the safest bet. It worked for them last time. I don't see why it wouldn't work again. I, I, I don't know if Microsoft is any more focused on streaming than Sony is, though. I think like Sony owns Gaikai. They have PS Now. You can, I don't, as far as I know, you can't stream games on Xbox. As far as I'm aware. I have not. I have never seen that option available. Right. They have. They have native they're, backwards compatibility. Yeah. They're they're more backwards compatibility. They're more on the. I think Microsoft's approach is more like let's get our stuff everywhere as opposed to let's stream stuff. But yeah, no. I think this is just kind of the the strategy that they built, and the the PS4 strategy worked super well. I don't see why they wouldn't do that again. I think Sony needs to be a little more guarded this time because it's certain that Microsoft, at least from my perspective, is trying to play the same game oh. or use the same strategy that they used last that Sony used last time. Oh, I think they're gonna do the same yeah. No, I think they're I think Microsoft is gonna come out with something that's basically the same. Except right. now their exclusives are gonna be playable everywhere. Right. Which exactly. is gonna be super weird. Exactly. That's super interesting. Yeah. It's actually interesting with Cuphead, I don't know what the publishing details per se were with Cuphead. I don't know that Microsoft I know that Microsoft like basically paid to acquire it early and I don't think it can be published on PlayStation, but I did notice that when it was published on Nintendo, when I played it on Switch, there was no Microsoft splash screen or anything. So yeah. there's a lot of interesting stuff going on there too, but I think that Sony just needs to watch its flank because their strategy with PS4 was gr a great strategy. So there's no reason to deviate from it, but now you're having 
a competitor that's going to do the same thing. Buying those studios last year and introducing them last year when they had nothing to show, and in fact, were still some of them making games for other platforms, I think was a way for them to just play the long game and then start to introduce things and introduce that seed that, no, we are also for gamers. And it might be a bit a different thing, like you said, like we're for gamers wherever you are, where Sony's like, we have a really great ecosystem. You can play your games here. And you know what would be we, interesting? And we believe it. If, because PS4 and Xbox have typically released with similar power capabilities, similar... The Xbox and the PS3 weren't particularly that much different in, in terms of power, or uh, and, and they never really have been. I wonder if Microsoft's exclusives or first-party titles being available on multiple platforms will allow them to release their console at a lower price point for the same for the same power. It's possible. Just because they would have a far bigger install base, inherently. Right. It, it reminds me a little bit of like a two or three pronged approach. Yeah. I don't know why I think about Uber when I think about this, but like Uber's valuation is enormous right now. They lose a ton of money and basically their entire business is routed through people picking you up and bringing you somewhere. But suddenly one day the business like that is going to change and suddenly cars are going to start picking you up with no one in them. All those people are going to be displaced. They're going to start trucking things around. So in other words, like yeah. the business just really suddenly changes, right? Yeah, like it's sure. being built to just suddenly pivot to being something totally different. And I think that that's what Microsoft is doing in a similar way. I think this box, this new box that's been rumored that they're clearly going to release the next Xbox. I think conclusively that's going to be their last box because I think what you said is true. I think eventually there's like we see the future as Microsoft or Xbox being a brand that is available everywhere. And I do wonder if that is just not inevitable, like the people that are holding on to the old school ecosystems like I am. You're less so. But like where I really want an ecosystem, I like PlayStation, I like playing there. I don't know if it's going to be an option for more than a little while. PlayStation will probably be releasing its final box as well as we know it here. And yeah. then eventually your smart TV is going to have a PlayStation app or something like that. I, I do think that that's probably where we're going. I think I think so, too. Yeah, it's all speculative at this point. That's the thing about procrast uh, prognostication, right, Chris, is that. We're going to look like idiots. <laughs> I remember 2012 or 2011, 2010, 2012. Yeah, it was like, we're going to have modular boxes. Or consoles are dead. And I remember even when the consoles were announced, people were like, these things are going to fucking bomb. And it's it's just, a, and I, I, I wasn't really one of those people, but I definitely made a lot of wrong predictions myself. And so I think it's safe to say whatever we think is going to happen is not what's going to actually happen. Yeah. Metal for Metal wrote into us and said, as a gamer turning 35 this year, the promise of better graphics and faster loading times resonates less and less with me. Do you think the PlayStation 5 will introduce something truly groundbreaking to excite middle-aged gamers looking for a different experience i also turned 35 this year metal for metal i don't know i don't i'm really of the mind we've said this so much that i don't want to be repetitive but i really am of the mind that the way we play games is not fundamentally going to change with these boxes it's simply going to be loading times the no loading is a great example like where it's basically just these kind of accoutrements well, to the game yeah. that are made better no loading better resolutions better frame rates more integrative multiplayer yeah, whatever just, the yeah, case just, might be. just better machines with uh, more capabilities Th right. things that can do more with ai things that can do more with uh, procedural generation or like texture mapping and like just like a little quality of life improvements i don't know what the what the obsession with breaking the ground is the ground is good <laughs> we live on the ground <laughs> like we don't need to break the ground every time like it's good to just have solid solid ground to build a found to build your foundation on just have like hey look this is the way we're gonna play games every groundbreaking thing we've had so far there's motion controls it's groundbreaking yeah it is I don't use it. <laughs> VR is pretty groundbreaking, We broke too. the ground and buried the fucking Wiimote. That's the thing. We broke the ground <laughs> and it's just a sinkhole now. We could say the same thing about VR, I suppose, which, I'm, which I which I think we're firmer believers in. I, yeah, I think VR has a little bit more staying power, but I, I, ironically enough, I think VR is the only thing that <laughs> allowed motion controls to stick around in a, any viable way. That's totally true. And someone made a good point online. I don't know where I saw it that with the exception of the GameCube controller, which has worked... I guess for the GameCube and then it worked on Wii, it worked on Wii U and it works on Switch in some capacity yeah, with does. the Smash Brother games. PlayStation Move is maybe the only other controller that works across that many that many generations because it'll now work on PS3, PS4. And since we know PSVR is going to work on PS5, therefore PlayStation Move yeah. is going to work on PS5. It's amazing. Yeah. This like totally random piece of tech that like has just stayed around. But those are t those are technological advances that technically you could argue that break new ground. And they do. Right. They're way better than the Wiimote to be fair. Well, yeah, they are. For sure. But I think I don't know, like I there's nothing nothing's going to be better than a screen. And a controller works. Like there's nothing to improve really. Like all you can really do is improve the form factor. The, the way we play games is fine. I will say I agree with you to a, a large extent, extent, but it does go back to what we were talking about earlier that that's why I really think they might have a hard sell with this thing because 
I really just I've been playing games for 30 years now. You can't take everything I say like for sure, like, you know, this is the way it is and this is the way it was. But that when people jump to N64, for instance, which was around the time you were born, just a couple years later. Yeah, there wasn't a massive rush to N64. There wasn't a massive rush to PlayStation. There wasn't a massive rush to PS2, mostly because people couldn't find them. And then they wanted them for DVD players, and obviously it sold 150 million units. The thing is, is that I don't know that we've ever been this satisfied. I really don't know. People can write in, but the machines have not been this capable before. And so, like, it's hard for me to be excited. I'm, I'm more interested in what the PS5 is than excited to play it. I'm like, OK, like, yeah, I, so, th- I think also video games just like look great now anyway. Like if, if something looks like next gen, it's kind of hard for me to tell because so many games look great. But I, I, I don't know. I, I've noticed even on the PS4 Pro that I have, there's uh, there's chugging. You know, I've seen games chug, and it's like, uh, you know, I I could see, especially in a year or two, this being very, very rough around the edges. And I think what what the next generation is going to be is just a smoother edge. I think it's when it's just going to be like a reliable piece of hardware, just like our phones. Like when our phones go get slow, we're like, ah, oh, this is fucking unbearable. I need a new phone. It's not because you need you need a new phone. It's just the experience of using your current phone becomes so tedious and irritating that you just can't help but being like, okay, I'm going to go for the next thing. It, I think that's the environment that we're in now with tech. Yeah, you could be right. You probably are right, indeed. Kyle Flory wrote into us with a really interesting question. I like this question a lot because I had not considered this at all. He says, hello, Colin and Chris. Since we now have confirmation that the PS5 will be backwards compatible with PS4 games, do you think it's possible that cross-generation games could be handled differently than they were during the 2013 console transition? Someone who wanted to play a game on PS3 and PS4 simply had a double dip. But this time around, the existence of backwards compatibility could allow other options. A universal copy that works on PS4, PS4 Pro, and PS5 seems like a possibility, in addition to letting users upgrade a digital PS4 game to a PS5 version for free. Or for a fee, I'm sorry. Publishers do exist to make money, though, so maybe they will just expect us to buy two versions again. I became a patron when Sacred Symbols was launched and love listening to the show every Tuesday on my way way home from work. Keep up the fantastic work. Thank you, Kyle. This is a really good question. I think it would be a big move for Sony to put out updates for uh, games, especially on disc that people own that they can put in their PS5s and then they'll up res or they'll, or they'll have like a new update because they they did this with this blew my mind, by the way. I know this isn't in a PlayStation ecosystem at all. The Xbox 360 copy of Halo 3, if you put it in an Xbox One X, runs at 4K. I don't know how the hell that happens. I don't know what that is, but if they can do that with an Xbox 360 game, surely, surely Sony can do it with a one generation uh, previous PS4 game. I have no reason to believe that they wouldn't be able to do that. I'm concerned a little bit with, listen, again, speaking from a layman's perspective as far as tech is concerned, but only knowing what the output has been, I get a little concerned with Sony's knowledge, engineering knowledge compared to Microsoft's, like just, just systemic knowledge. You know, they Microsoft said that certain things were simply not possible on Xbox One and through software and firmware fixed it. Sony took 11 years to let us change our PSN names. That, that's, I, I, you know what I mean? Like, that's I, true. I, I just feel like I feel like Microsoft's on because of the because of the nature of the company that they come from. Yeah, they're, are a, soft, just, they're a software first company. Right. For sure. I, I feel like they just are better equipped to do all this stuff than Sony has been in the past. I'm not making well, I don't know Sony's well, talent at an engineering level, but it just seems like everything is just way harder for it's them. It's definitely different. And there's definitely a different skill level. But I, I do think I mean, even on PS4 to PS4 Pro, I, surely they've been thinking about the next generation for a while. If the console, uh, if the article was right, and this this has been an R&D for like, since the launch of the PS4, I would imagine that they would have something in place that would allow them if there is already a thing for PS, PS4, uh, base PS4 to PS4 Pro to have performance mode, I would imagine on the PS5 there would be some kind of like unlocked kind of maximum settings like there would be for PS, PC games, especially because a lot of console games are developed on PCs. Or like all of them are, you know? Yeah, this generation they yeah. certainly are. So like, I, I don't know, I, I'd imagine, I, I would be shocked if they would make you buy a new version of especially just because they have to ingratiate an entirely new audience to a very expensive machine. They have to pull every kind of uh, available avenue that they can go down to make it easier for people to transition. They have to they have to go down those avenues. Yeah, I'm in total agreement with you uh, on that front. I just wonder what their capability is going to be, what the monetary reality too is of doing something like this. But it's such a nice thing. It just reminds me of some games when that weren't trophy enabled, th- just as an example, Resistance Fall Man from Insomniac, which was a launch game on PS3, they never went back and gave it trophies because they were like, well, it doesn't pay for us to go and send this through QA again and certification. No one's going to play it or like very few people are going to go back and play it. And it's not we're not going to sell the game again. And so I wonder if Sony will look at it that way and be like, 
who cares? Like we're, we're like it, it's very similar to when they locked out things on, like things on PS3 and then they like uh, Linux support and stuff. And then they were like, none of you use it. So we, we can see who's using this and none of you do. So why are you even making a big deal about this? They might have a similar thing, too, with cross generational games and stuff. But I would love to see a situation where at least the first party games were handled in such a way where maybe everything from Killzone Shadowfall up does have a patch that they're they're working on that will make the games better on PS5. But again, we're talking about a situation where they like couldn't even effectively launch Drive Club, where games are getting like delayed all the time. And they just they just in a technical way, they just they don't seem to be very talented in this. Regard. I, mean, they, they, I, I don't know. I, well, I just I don't know. I understand. Uh, but they did, they did show. I mean, part of the showcase that they did for the article was they showed Spider-Man running on, on next gen hardware and they showed like a way increased load times. So surely they have a version of Spider-Man that is at least enhanced in some way right. for the next generation of, of consoles. I would be shocked if you would have to buy a new version of Spider-Man just so fast travel is way shorter. Right. Yeah, like, that's that a would... good that's a good point. I wonder if it would even in, I don't know, man. This is this is so above my head in, in terms of this, but I wonder if it would even be necessary to patch it at all or if the PS5 would just be like we I think it would read, just run, I think it would just run it better. Right. I, in other words, you just put the game in and it just runs it better. Yeah, like, that's exactly like a PC. Right. Like right. I I think that's probably what the case would be. I don't I don't imagine every single PS4 game will run better. I'd imagine like maybe even something like Killzone Shadowfall is probably way far behind, so Maybe that will just maybe look a little bit better. Maybe like a little bit of an increase in load times just because it might be specific to the PS4 architecture. I don't know. I'm not like a game dev, but I would imagine it would be hard for me to imagine that they wouldn't improve them in some way. This also brings up a really interesting side component to Kyle's question, which is something he didn't explicitly ask, but I think that he's thinking and I'm certainly thinking, which is like now are these late gen PS4 games going to be native to PS5? Is it like are, what, are, what do you mean? Like, are they going to ma be made to run on PS5 yeah. and then just kind of be and then kind on of released on PS4 as well? Kind of like a, a, actually a great example is Zelda. That was really a Wii U game. And then they held it and made it for and put it to switch. But that's really a Wii U game. Right. Like that's a, and they released it for Wii U and like really limited numbers or with Twilight Princess. It's the same thing. They yeah. released it, it was a GameCube game. They released it with very limited numbers on GameCube made it opposite so Link was right-handed for some reason and put it on, on Wii. So I just wonder if there's going to be a similar thing now where we're going to, like, these maybe... Death, I've been saying Death Stranding is going to PS5 game forever, but Death Stranding and maybe even Ghost of Tsushima, I don't think Last of Us is one of these games, but maybe no. they're going to be released for both consoles, like literally released for both consoles, which is something that PS5 or PlayStation, in thinking about it, I don't think it's ever happened. I don't know that there's been an exclusive game that has actually been on both consoles at the same time. We got The Last of Us and shit, Uncharted and shit later, but just another interesting thought exercise. Yeah. As it were. I don't know. Very exciting stuff to think about. It's a brave new world. It is. All right, Chris, let's move on. Number two, though we discussed it on last week's show, we have confirmation this week that The Last of Us Part Two, under development for PS4 at Sony-owned studio Naughty Dog, has officially shot its final motion capture scenes with its protagonists. In a tweet sent out after the last episode of Sacred Symbols was already recorded and published, Neil Druckmann showed the world a picture of actors Ashley Johnson and Troy Baker, who play Ellie and Joel, in their motion capture gear. The accompanying text says, quote, and that's a wrap on Ellie, Joel, and the most ambitious cinematic shoot we've ever done. Tears were shed, end quote. The timing of this wrap is going to make it difficult, though certainly far from impossible for The Last of Us's long-awaited sequel to be released in 2019's calendar year. Though observant Naughty Dog fans have noted that The Last of Us and Uncharted 4, also helmed by Neil Druckmann, had approximately six months of time between mocap being wrapped and the game launching. So it's entirely possible, and I think people are saying that November could be a release date. There was a leak from a Polish game website that put September 27th as the release date. Yeah, I saw that one. Now, September 27th is a Friday. This is becoming the common day of the week that Sony is releasing games globally now, their first party games. I'm actually, I believe that date. I don't know if that date was ever meant to be in, like sent out publicly. I don't know if they're going to stick by that date, but I believe it. That at one time that was true. Yeah. Maybe it's still true. Yeah, September we'll 27th would be big. That would be, That'd big, be huge. Yeah, no, for sure. But that seems really close. Really yeah. close. Especially with the, the culture around crunch now. I wonder if they would even bother trying to hit that date. Or even bother, even bothering trying to get it out this year. Yeah, I think that if you don't get it out, I, I'm of the mind that you shouldn't be releasing these games any further than September because then you're dealing with the third party megaton fucking Call of Duties and Battlefields and all the. I, don't, I just don't. I, I personally have the mind you don't need to release any first party games in that window. You you should release them very early in the year. You I should think release summer. them in the summer or you should release them in September. I think summer is ideal. Yeah, summers are great. I mean, and that's why I thought The Last of Us was going to be a summer game because it first of all felt like a summer game to me. I don't know if that's just what it was or whatever. I don't know, but yeah. it just felt right in the summer. 
I, I'd be a little more disturbed. I mean, I'll, I'll drop anything and everything to play the sequel of the game. That's that's going to happen. But it's just a more competitive landscape. Does it matter? I guess is the question because it's a huge game. It's going to command time. But if I were them, I'd be like, why would we ever want to release anything? You know, with all these shooters and all these persistent games and all these big holiday games, that's not our style. We don't need to do that. You know? Yeah, for sure. So especially because they're hardware sellers, really. Number three, a select player or group of players that have gained early access to the upcoming fighter Mortal Kombat 11 have leaked what is apparently a potentially full list of the game's DLC characters mined from the game's data. So if you don't want to hear this, you might want to fast forward just a little while. While Shang Tsung has already been revealed as DLC, the following characters as relayed by website Eurogamer haven't been announced but are likely coming at some point. Joker. It's pretty interesting. Nightwolf. Terminator. Pretty stoked about that one. Sindel. Spawn, which isn't a huge surprise. Ash, Fujin, and Shiva. So this apparently was all in the PC data for an early copy of the game that was like released on accident. Joker from Smash or, or Joker from Persona or Joker from... I would assume Joker from Batman. Okay, yeah, that's what I assume. Yeah. It would be awesome if Joker from Smash was in there. I guess it's unclear. But I think that Nether... What's the Nether Realm? That's the studio, right? I think they have a relationship with DC because they did that DC fighting game. So you have to assume yeah, that that's it's Joker. Yeah, that's why I yeah. like it, yeah. Number four. GameStop, in the midst of an historic plunging of market value after posting a nearly $700 million annual loss, is trying something new that may be of note to consumers that buy and play their new games immediately upon launch. As reported by multiple sources, GameStop is calling the program Guaranteed to Love It and allows a customer to purchase and return a game within 48 hours of launch. That's of launch. Just remember, It's key to understand that it doesn't mean 48 hours from when you buy the game before when it's available. It's literally 48 hours from when the game's available. The program will only be available in the U.S. for the time being, and only eligible games are included, with PS4 exclusive Days Gone the first to test the waters. Since the game will be available on April 26th, you'd theoretically have until the end of business on April 28th to return the game for a full refund. So this is again called Guaranteed to Love It. If you buy a new game that is partaking in this program, from the moment it is released for sale, 48 hours, you can theoretically return it and get your money back. Pretty interesting. This is strange. It is strange. I will say this. I don't know if you remember this era. I think you might. Is that when I was a kid, in the PS1 era especially, I was, I don't want to say dishonest, but I really did push it to the limit. I was in eighth grade. I remember doing this. You could return any game, open game you wanted to EB or GameStop. Oh, yeah, sure, for sure. Like for after a week, you could be like, I don't want it anymore. And I used to do that all the time. I did it with X-Men versus Street Fighter. I did it with like a bunch of games where I'm like, I'm just done. And then you get your, it was $50 for a game at the time. And then you just buy another $50 game. I couldn't fucking, well, I remember being like in seventh and eighth grade being like, this is unbelievable. That I'm like, I'm allowed to do this. Like, I couldn't, almost couldn't believe it. Yeah. And I did it a few times. And then you want to keep a game, so you keep it. But that is the most reminiscent of that era. But this is like a really tight window. Like, there are going to be people that go to the Days Gone launch and play that game nonstop for 36 hours and, and return, return it, it yeah. just to get $60 back. Seems no, like a bit of a waste of time. 100%. Today. I'm sure there are some people. It's probably not enough to be concerned about, but there will be... There will 100% be someone out there who does it. If you are, if you do do this or attempt it, let us know right into us so we know. I want to know how it goes because I want to see like how crazy they are about the time. Yeah, that's not encouraging it, by the way. No, it's awful. <laughs> I mean, I mean, GameStop's dead, dude. I mean, it's not gonna. They're, it's just not gonna exist. I mean, still, don't get, it's already dead. The it's all, Simpsons. Yeah, yeah, it's a little sad. Not really. Number five. Sony has revealed that it's releasing a full-length documentary all about the development of God of War, which was released by Sony Santa Monica back in the spring of 2018. In a letter to the audience written on the PlayStation blog, Scott Rohde, personal friend, really great guy, who leads Sony's American Dev Studios, noted that the documentary would be released for free on PlayStation's YouTube channel and charts, quote, the massive undertaking it took to change the course of the God of War franchise, end quote. The documentary was compiled for more than 400 hours of footage, and its release date is unknown, though it should be launched soon. Carlos Strife wrote into us on Patreon and says, Hey, Colin and Chris, how's it going? Don't worry about it, Carlos. This past week, God of War completed one year since its release. This was such an important game to me. Not only I, not only I absolutely loved it and became a fan of the series and of Barlog's work, but it also helped me through some of the tough times since only three days after 420, my girlfriend broke up with me. It was hard, but the game was there for me and helped a lot. What are your guys' opinions on the game now that a year has passed? Also, Santa Monica is releasing a documentary about the game soon, which is exciting. Thanks for your great podcast and making my week so much better every time. Lads. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> yeah. You're clearly British. Now, what do you think? It's been a, been a year. Yeah. God of War is a substantial PlayStation 4 exclusive. It might actually be Dollars for Donuts, the most important one, which is interesting to me. What do you think about it a year out? I, I still love it. I like it. I think it's my favorite one. I think it's my favorite first party PS4 game. I think still. For sure. I think a lot of people would agree with you. Yeah. 
I think that it's a holds cr- up. It's an incredibly finely made game that was really fun to play. Mm-hmm. That really had very immersive mechanics and very fine tuned mechanics. I'm still of the mind that it really fucked a lot of things up. That that held the game back from a final polish standpoint. Quick travel system's terrible. The maps are terrible. Uh, I, the whole segmented nature of it, I thought, was a little disjointed. But it's for a first foray into a reestablished franchise. It's an incredible accomplishment and just sold millions and millions of copies. And people really have just gleaned on to this game and held on to it as something that really resonates and that defines the PlayStation 4. And I, I got to be honest with you, Chris, I just didn't expect it. I knew that it was going to be good. If not great, I but I didn't know it was going to define the console. Like I that. expected the opposite. I I remember leading up to it, I was like, "This is going to be. This is not. I don't like anything about this." Because I, I it just looked to me like they just took God of War and were like, "Let's make Last of Us, but God of War." And I was like, "Oh, why? That's not why. I, that's not why I play God of War. What the heck is this?" And I was really, really not keen on anything that they were doing up until I played. Even when I started playing, I was like, "All right." I'm carrying a tree, ooh, cinematic, slow walking, can't do anything, it's story time, but then it just, like, sucked me in, it's, like, it's the opposite of, like, every experience, you know what I mean? I expected to hate it. Any game that I can play that I expect to hate that ends up making me love it is, is, that's a lot, that's hard to do. It's certainly a, an impressive game. I don't know that it's my favorite first party game. I don't know what, what even would yeah, be. Yeah, what would be your I'd first? I really have to think about it, like, I still really love Resogun. That's technically a second party game, but they published it. I think that that's like a fantastic, really, really fantastic game. But as far as what we're talking about, I kind of like Spider-Man even more than God of War, I think. Detroit's a second party game. Bloodborne is a technically a second party game. But, you know, these are all first party published. So yeah, for sure. I think that there's a lot of games. You know, I will say that the game, the first party game I was most disappointed by, Dollars to Donuts, was Uncharted 4. I will say that. Really? Yeah. I just wasn't blown away by it at all. I was just like, I don't know. Feels like an unnecessary four. Yeah. Which there's a lot of. Yes. Unfortunately. I, I would have loved to see what they would have done with that time and that those resources just making a new IP. Did you get what I did there? Yeah, I, I, I did. I did see it. I just was trying to. Un- unfortunate. Yeah. I'm just trying to pass by. I don't really want to talk about oh, it. Oh. If that's okay with you. <laughs> Number six. Konami has revealed the full lineup of games that will appear in the Castlevania Anniversary Collection that's due out on PlayStation 4 on May 16th. There are eight games in total, and four of them have already been revealed. NES's Castlevania and Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, Game Boy's Castlevania 2, Belmont's Revenge, and Super Nintendo's Super Castlevania 4. The other four games are NES's Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, hell yeah, Game Boy's Castlevania The Adventure, and Genesis's Castlevania Bloodlines, as well as Kid Dracula. Kid Dracula's inclusion is the most notable, as it was never released in the West. Konami launched the game on Famicom in 1990, where in Japan, it was called Akumajo Special Boku Dracula-kun. The Castlevania collection is the second of three collections Konami revealed as part of its 50th anniversary. The first one, the arcade collection, which I mentioned earlier, is already on PS4, while the third collection, based around Contra, will launch on PlayStation 4 this summer. Well, So I'm really it, excited about I'm really it, excited about the Castlevania collection. I want to see those trophies real bad. Is it weird to you that Symphony of the Night isn't in there, or are you okay with that? No, I'm fine with that, because first of all, Symphony of the Night just came to PS4 last fall. Right. But this is clearly a collection that is supposed to celebrate their old games. I right, think right. that... A lot of people are freaking out not only about Symphony of the Night being not being on it, but like Circle of the Moon and all the other Metroidvania games. And I'm I simply say to you guys, wait. And if you want to see those things, buy this collection. You said that exactly like those traffic stops. Yes. Do. Wait. Wait. That was gross. And then it starts flashing, and you don't really know if you should push it or not. Yeah. I really like getting to know stoplights in my neighborhood and just totally gaming the system so I can jaywalk as much as possible. You know. I'm not convinced they do anything. What, stoplights or jaywalking? The, the whole, like, press the button. The oh, wall. no, they definitely don't do anything. It's a placebo for sure. Definitely. It's just like the close button in elevators, although the close button in my elevator works in this building, and I use it all the time so that we don't have to share the elevator with anyone. If I hear someone, I'm like, start jamming the button. <laughs> Godspeed. Got to get out of here. Got to get out of here. But, no, I think that Symphony of the Night, people have to look at it through this lens. It's the 50th anniversary of Konami as a game maker and as a publisher and a company. And they're celebrating fucking Twin B and Gradius and shit. They, they don't care about the games they made in 1997. I think that they're eventually going to get there. Yeah. And I think that if these sell well enough, which I hope they do, I hope the Castlevania collection sells well enough, then hopefully we get a, a fucking massive collection of the Metroidvania games. In fact, it would be awesome if they just released them one off with each a platinum trophy and shit. I'd be all over those. Life would shut down if they released those games. I believe that. But these old Castlevania games, Chris, I don't know how familiar you are with them. I love those games, and this is a really great way for people to kind of get to know where Castlevania came from. Castlevania now is very different than where it was. These are very hard, very grueling, very stiff, 
platformers yeah. and they're fucking tough now the only one of those that i've played is simon's quest oh i love simon's quest i liked it a lot but i also hated it <laughs> it's really confusing simon's quest for people that don't know is the second castlevania game and back in the nes era it was very common for companies to release a sequel that was very different than the original game so we had that with zelda and we had that with others we had that with mario stateside we had that with a bunch of stuff and we had that with castlevania and the original castlevania can be beat in like 15 minutes if you know how to play it it's just six stages side scrolling linear but the second game is an open world role playing game and it's really one of the first games of its kind it's really a successor in a lot of ways to symphony of the night and is kind of considered a bastard child because it's so oddly translated and the game overtly lies to you like intentionally lies to you and gives you bad information and stuff like that and it was just lost in translation and people were confused by it i always think that that game got really short shrift so i was nervous when they announced the games that they were going to leave it out and I was going to get fucking really mad because <laughs> it has to be in there. Even if you don't appreciate it the way it should be appreciated, it's such a good game. I'm telling you guys, if you've not played Simon's Quest, when this comes out and you do play it, you're going to understand where these action role-playing games, where these non-linear role-playing games, where Metroidvanias and everything, they all come from this game. And I think it's pretty cool. So Hell yeah. very excited to play that. Very excited for the 15th of May. Hopefully we get it early. Now, this is a weird one. This was weird to me. Number seven. A complete remake of 13, spelled in Roman numerals, so X-I-I-I, yeah. is coming to PlayStation 4 on November 13th. 13 originally launched on PlayStation 2 alongside GameCube, Xbox, and PC in November of 2003. I remember because I was a freshman in college and I bought it. And it's a first-person shooter developed and published by Ubisoft. However, 13's true history rests outside of video games. It's actually a Belgian graphic novel series that started in the mid-80s. And the video game revolves around the graphic novel's first five volumes. The game was notable at the time for its cell shaded graphics and stealth action gameplay and was generally well received. Development is being headed by French studio Microids, a team best known for its adventure series Siberia and mobile games like Gear Club Unlimited. It's unclear if Ubisoft is acting again as publisher. I don't know who's publishing this game or who owns it. It's a remake, so you assume Ubisoft as a publisher owns it, but they were not mentioned anywhere in the blog thread and I couldn't find their mention anywhere in any of the write-ups about it. So this might be something that somehow Microids acquired. They're a French studio, Ubisoft's a French publisher, so there might be a relationship there. So anyway, that's happening. I, I think that that's kind of cool. I was when I saw that, I was like, "What?" It's I, really I, weird. I didn't, yeah, I didn't. I only vaguely remembered that game. It's a really pretty game. Yeah, I remember that. I, that's what the thing that I remembered about it. It's a really, really. It looked really cool. Yeah, it's I a, never played it though. It's a pretty one. Uh, well, we'll have a chance. And that was the other surprising thing. November thirteenth, they were they announced it like way ahead of time. Yeah, this is a game I think that would have benefited more from summer. Like, Summer, not only summer, but announcing it literally like two weeks before it came out. Like, what's the point of announcing 13 now? And again, releasing it in November. That's a crowded, especially in November specifically is like super crowded. That's no, like Call like, of Duty time. But anyway, people should go look up 13 footage. I ha I think I had it on GameCube or Xbox. I didn't have it on PS2, but it's an interesting and really pretty game. Yeah. Cell shading just holds up. It does. The original Borderlands still looks great. Number eight. Way back in January of 2008, EA published the Criterion-developed game Burnout Paradise on PS3 as well as Xbox 360 and PC. And now, nearly 11 and a half years after launch, EA has revealed that it's finally pulling the plug on the game's servers. The servers will close on August 1st, close to 12 full years from launch, though the server closure will only affect the last-gen version of the game. As you may know, Burnout Paradise was remastered for next-gen, including PS4, just last year, and that version will continue to operate without interruption. I wanted to throw that in there just because... We're talking about how long games should be supported, and we talk about pulling plugs on games too quickly. EA kept the plug plugged in for Burnout Paradise for 11 and a half years. So I don't want to hear any fucking excuses about <laughs> how we can't keep the we can't keep Killzone Shadowfall plugged in or whatever game is going to die next. Yeah. yeah, a little weird. So shout out to EA. Rare shout out to EA. Yeah, for that. And finally, number nine is a wrap up. The PlayStation blog reports that Japanese MMORPG Caravan Stories is coming to Western PS4s this summer. That's a pretty big story, apparently, according to some people. Hmm. Push Square reports that Car Mechanic Simulator will launch on PlayStation 4 on June 25th. That sounds like it's right up our alley yeah. for a, a possible Let's Play. And finally, website Gamatsu reports that side-scrolling RPG Dark Devotion will be coming to PS4 later this year, that puzzler Pig Eat Ball will be coming to PS4 this summer, that horror game Daymare 1998 is coming to PS4 later this year, that RPG Dragon Star Varner is coming to PS4 on June 11th, and that developer WayForward is teaming up with the Japanese dev and publisher Arc System Works to create a game called River City Girls, which will take place in the old-school River City universe. Further details are due out about the game later in 2019, and it's important to note that we're merely merely assuming the game is coming to PlayStation, uh, PlayStation platforms. I assume it'll be a PS4 game. Yeah, it's a pretty safe assumption, I think. So not a lot of news. A lot of PS5 things that we wanted to talk about, but not. I was surprised, actually, that yeah. not much had happened this it's week. It's a slow little uh, 
period of time. But that will allow us to get into the new game releases. Before we do, though. There's also not a lot of those. No. Shocking. I want to talk about this in a minute, by the way. Powell Predge, and I'm sorry if I'm not mispronouncing your name right into us, said, hey, CNC, just a quick note about your mini rant that Sony doesn't care about the PSN store because they allow two snooker snooker games to be released <laughs> on the same day. The thing is, is that the World Snooker Championship began this week. I think both developers wanted to release their respective games to coincide with this event. You are right that the state of the store is questionable, but this time there was a reason for what happened. That's totally fine. I still think Sony had the obligation to tell them that they're releasing the games at the same time and one of them could have released the game last week and one of them could have released the game this week or something like that. I still think that th them those games coming out at the same time is still a sign that no one is watching what's happening and no one cares. Maybe, it, yeah. I That's, just refuse to believe that they they went to these guys and were like, listen, you know you're releasing a game at the same time as another guy. And they're both like, yeah, that's fine. It is hard to believe. <laughs> it is very unlikely to me. Oh, and, and you know, it's a huge coincidence, by the way, Chris, that only six games are coming out this week when Days Gone's coming out. Huh. It's almost like they care about what games are coming out only when it affects their products, but not S anyone else's. Snooker. Snooker. You're right, cunt. You're right, cunt. All right, let's read, Chris. I have right. no initiative here, and no, I'm not trying to force you into anything uncomfortable, so you can go first or you can go second. All right, I'll go. A chair in a room, Greenwater, comes mm. to PSVR. This eerie and atmospheric thriller immerses you in your own horror story, using a number of locations, flashbacks, and memories that are often jarring and disorienting. You will solve clues. My life. <laughs> you will solve clues and puzzles to piece together your past. Unlock your memories and reveal why you have awoken in the sinister Greenwater Institute. There's so many of these PSVR games that are like I just just come and go. There's a lot of them. There's, yeah, like every it's week. It's kind of impressive. Day D through time comes to PS4. Brian is a gifted and eccentric scientist who has created a time machine and traveled into the past. But his former friend, Dr. Terrible, is already here. He created a time machine before Brian. Can you stop, Dr. Terrible? This adventure is full of mysteries, adventure, and of course, journeys through time. This adventure is full of mysteries and adventure. That's really great writing. I hope so. And again, another reason, and another reason, no one read that one either. Just copy and paste that one into the PlayStation <laughs> blog. Uh, oh, Days Gone comes to PS4. Uh, Days Gone is an open world action adventure game set in a harsh wilderness two years after a devastating global pandemic. Play as Deacon St. John, a drifter and bounty hunter who rides the broken road, fighting to survive while searching for a reason to live. Right. Yeah, me too. Yep. Welcome. We'll have more on that soon. Yeah. Jupiter and Mars comes to PS4 and PSVR. Jupiter and Mars is an underwater adventure set in a future Earth. Sea levels have risen from melting ice caps and climate change. As a result, the coastal cities are all but completely submerged. Since man's disappearance, the oceans have begun to reclaim themselves. Will Jupiter and Mars succeed in bringing life back to the oceans? Mortal Kombat 11 comes to PS4. Mortal Kombat is back and better than ever in the next evolution of the iconic franchise. The all-new custom character variations give unprecedented control over your fighters, and the new graphics engine showcases every eye-popping movement uh, moment. Mortal Kombat's best-in-class cinematic story mode <laughs> continues the epic saga over 25 years in the making. I really think that they're being facetious with that right now. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> Zeroptian Invasion comes to PS4 and Vita. Taking inspiration from old-school arcade shooters from the past and adding in some modern touches, Zeroptian Invasion is this decade's answer to arcade shooters of yesteryear, with increasingly difficult gameplay, stunning pixel art, and a chiptune soundtrack. So those are the only six games. And I just want to repeat one more time, what a shock that Days Gone is coming out in a clear store. Huh. Yeah. Weird. They are paying attention sometimes. So obviously we are yeah. going to talk more about Days Gone, and Mortal Kombat is obviously a game people want to yeah, pay attention to. Yeah, and obviously, there, hey, there's a PSVR game for those of you who have PSVR. Mm-hmm. Two PSVR games. Is there two? two? Yeah, a chair in a room, and also Jupiter and Mars oh, right, can yeah, be yeah. played on VR. I think it can be played without it, though. So it's like te uh, Tetris Effect. Exactly. Cool, cool. Now, Chris, to wrap things up as we always do, I have put some questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas from the audience. Remember, you guys can submit your questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and ideas as we've read throughout this podcast and as we will finish this podcast with by supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Stand. We hope that you choose to do so. Typically, we end with eight. I'm ending with seven this time, specifically because... We read so many yeah. during the PS5 thing. I didn't want to keep everyone forever. Jamal Bushara wrote into us and said, Hey, CNC, I would love to hear your opinion of censorship. And if you think there's a direct contradiction in the general gamer thought process, that games are art and shouldn't be censored, yet seem to think certain words are unacceptable and request the publisher make changes because they might offend people or a group. Is there a balance or are the two irreconcilable? Jamal, to, and I, Chris, I'm interested to hear what you think about this. I actually think, Jamal, you're kind of creating... A straw man simply because 
the people who want to censor games are the ones that also are the ones that have a problem with the words in the games. It's always the same yeah, group yeah. of people that are busting balls. No, I would I would agree with you. Right. I, I think that's typically the same. And most people who are like most people who are anti censorship are usually the people who are like, yeah, let's let games be games. Right. I don't think that's there's really that much of an overlap between the others. Now, I want to be clear that I'm anti censorship, but there is a line for me. We, we talked about this, I think, a week or two ago. Like, I think any game should be allowed to exist. You can go make whatever game you want. Make your concentration camp game if you want. Yeah. You know, I'm going to judge you personally for making that game. I'm going to judge you personally for wanting to sell that game. I'm going to question your motive for making such a game. But the thing that I do want to say is that I wouldn't put that on my store. You know, I wouldn't sell that. Yeah, and, people people have a right to choose what, what goes on their store. In, right. in fact, forcing someone to put something on their store that they don't want on their store is kind of a weird form of censorship if you think about it. Because you're, you're giving you're not letting them choose what to, what their storefront should be. Right. It's a function of the market. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I personally, yeah, I would I would agree with you. I'm anti censorship. But like I have I have my own standards and I'll hold myself to those standards. Right. Exactly. And uh, that's it. Exactly right. So I think that Jamal, it's an interesting inquiry, but I think that we're talking about a few different things because I don't think Chris or I, and I think a lot of people don't have a problem with anyone doing whatever they want in their private time, but the storefronts do draw lines. And I think what we're talking about specifically here is that Sony might be drawing their line a little too high. Yeah. While I think that a, a storefront like Steam, I think does it pretty well from this perspective. I think Steam is flooded with garbage and I think that's a problem, but like we talked about that rape video game where they actually drew a line and that was somewhat controversial for multiple reasons because some people were like, why are you drawing a line? And some other people were like, this wasn't nearly vociferous enough of a response. And I think they I think they basically thread the needle pretty well over there. So, yeah, I think so. But I think, wasn't hatred on Steam, too? I think so. I think it's still on it, right? But Jamal does ask, is there are, are, is there a tension, an irreconcilable tension between art and between censorship? And, and I think that generally speaking, yes, of course. Yeah. But when art enters a free market, then all these other things come into play. It's not a museum piece. It's not something that just exists in your house. No one if you want to paint, you know, horrible imagery and and whatever a swastika on a and paint that and put it on your wall. I don't know. That's fine, I guess, if that's what you want to do. But the point I'm trying to make, of course, is that and I think Chris made it very eloquently, which is that like stores have their own expression of right in which they, what they sell. This is, of course, the whole thing people are arguing about with, like, should the baker make the the cake for the gay couple? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I I, I guess that's like a, yeah. a deeper question, right? Yeah, I feel a little bit I feel a little bit weird about that one. But yeah, for sure. I feel weird about it, too, because my actually my inherent answer is no, they shouldn't. But like you shouldn't be compelled to do anything. Right. But actually, the Civil Rights Act does compel us as a society to do all sorts of shit. And so, yeah, no, exactly. And that's not really a problem with anyone. So I, I do wonder, like, how you kind of reconcile those two things. But that's a United States problem or or not problem, but issue. Sergio DeVivo wrote into us and said, hey, guys, so what the hell is up with gaming journalism nowadays? Kotaku posted an article on Thursday saying that in the new Smash Brothers Persona 5 music track, there's a disability slur. The proof of this because it kind of sort of sounded close to it. That's it. Never. And so the word that they're talking about yeah. is retard. They thought that the writer thought that. In the Persona 5 track on on the game that there's someone in a spoken word segment of the song saying the word retard or let's they, they get thought retarded. It said, they thought it said retarded. Retarded. Yeah. So that just to fill anyone in. Never mind that the person singing is Japanese. So their R's and L's sound different than in, Eng in the English language. That, of course, is true. There is no, I think, native L sound in Japanese. So that's where the word English, for instance, comes from. Yeah. And pray station like that. I'm, I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to I'm not at all trying to be inappropriate. That's why you f you no, hear yeah, that, yeah. that intonation of the way they say it is that that L doesn't exist in their in their language. So per Sergio's point, that is also a reason why this might have been misheard because L's and R's are often misheard in, in that language. And so he says, never mind that it's most likely saying retarded as in the musical retardando, meaning to gradually slow down, which is interesting. Mm hmm. So that might be what they're saying there. Yeah. As of posting this, the article is still up on their site with a small update providing only on Twitter, not the article itself, saying that maybe they heard it wrong. Is this what passes for journalism these days? Colin, as somebody on the receiving end of a PC shitstorm, I need your help in understanding why the gaming media has become this way. What's the point of trying to find outrage in every single thing people do? Thanks for being my favorite podcast. I'm proud of being a Patreon supporter. Thank you, Sergio. Clicks, 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 eyes, attention, clicks. Yeah, what did you Word make of, of this mouth. whole? What did you make of this whole thing? That was stupid. <laughs> it's unnecessary, especially because like retard is a is a musical term. 
Like it is specific, especially the way it's used in this. And I, I, I heard it. It's like, yeah, that's definitely something like retard it. Right. Like I heard it. It's outrage. So it's going to get people talking about it. You asked a question about it because obviously it, it got you feeling a certain way and they bank on that. It's that's, unfortunate. That's you know? really what it is. I will say this. I, mean, I don't usually like to name names and, and talk specifically like this, but I'm going to. Is that the author, Laura Kate Dale, who's, as far as I know, a transgender woman, has often had a chip on her shoulder and looks for these kinds of stories in my experience. And people have brought up a bunch of things that I forgot about over the years. Like, and I don't know if these things are right or wrong or if these things happened or they didn't happen, but people had been saying basically like, this is a, this person has a track record of kind of seeking this shit out and kind of making an ordeal. Like, I think she was, I think she even claimed that she was like kidnapped at an E3 one year and stuff like Whoa. that. And, and like, ha- like maybe that happened. Is I don't that know. True? I don't know. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that like, there's all of this weird shit, sort of like drama surrounding this particular writer. And I actually tweeted at her online. She doesn't follow me or anything, but I tweeted her and I was just like, you have to like, it's a mis- You made a mistake and you should just move on from it. It's not a big deal. But you also all, also have to own that you have you have an agenda. And the people that are atta- and I said the people that are most vehemently attacking you also have an agenda. So that's important to know. Yeah, 100 percent. But. When you have agenda driven journalism, you look for shit all the time. And and this is happening in politics, too. I mean, with the recent Mueller investigation, we don't have to talk. I don't want to talk too deeply about this in specifics, but think about over time over the last few years, how many stories about that investigation are fucking totally wrong. Right. Like these source stories about someone going here and someone reading this and, and, and to the point where even Robert Mueller had to come out. Remember a few weeks ago and be like, this isn't true. Like the things you're reporting are simply not true. And so I understand why there's this tension between journalism and people who read journalism, no matter the field. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's politics or video games. And it's this kind of shit. The other thing I'll say about Laura K. Dale and, and why I was so unimpressed with this particular instance was how much if you read her Twitter account and everything, just passing the buck. Like, I don't have any respect for that. At some point, the, the buck has to stop with someone. The whole thing is she's saying, like, I kind of had to publish it. My, my, they changed the article. Like, you know, the editor in chief changed this and we weren't able to update it. And it's like, just, just, yeah, something own, about just like the fucking, servers yeah. not working or just not, own not it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like we're in an er- era right now where everybody's just kind of, there's a lot of clout behind fighting injustice. And that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, but then it gets to the point where we look for it everywhere. And in looking for it everywhere, we kind of find it and then like kind of make ourselves out to be heroes when we find it. We're like, hey, this needs to be st- Hey, the word retard was in here in a, com- in a completely valid context. Right. We got to get rid of it because retard is bad. And it's like you just kind of make yourself look like an idiot when you're just trying to look like a hero and get a lot of retweets and like a lot of clicks and a lot of uh, votes or whatever the hell it is you're looking for. It's OK to just be a person. You don't need to be a, the main character of everybody else's lives. You can just be who you are. You don't need to be a hero. For real. I agree. It's fine. I agree. And uh, yeah, it's always done in the name, not of justice or often not done in the name of justice, but the name done in the name of accolades and, yeah, and, and, and attention and clout. And I, I totally agree with you because the reason that this is such a shame is not because, listen, if, they, if that word was in there, that's actually somewhat newsworthy. It might actually be newsworthy more than anything about cultural differences between yeah. the way we use words and also kind of the borderline nature of the word retard in, Amer- in American and English vernacular. Like that's a word that hasn't really gone away. Like no. calling things gay, right? <laughs> is kind of like has kind of gone away and I think that that's 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 right. Or when I was a kid, people used to wor- use the word fag and faggot all the time. And yeah. that, those are words that aren't really used anymore because they're derogatory and they're hurtful, right? Mm-hmm. But the word retard for better or for worse kind of has lingered. And so it would be an inter- like that's kind of the disappointing thing about this is that you could have almost had a conversation. Yeah, there would there was an interesting discussion to be right, had about like why is it that this word is still kind of flung around but we don't use homo anymore, right? Like because they're both offensive and yeah. we and we really respect the need not to use the word homo, yeah. right? Or like you <laughs> yeah, know what no, I mean? For sure, yeah. It's very so that was in reflecting on it when I was reading her piece, I'm like, you know. Whether this was true or false, we could have had a really nice think piece about the way we talk, about yeah. the, the the toxicity of, of verbiage, about the toxicity of game. Something clever, but I just don't know that this per- this writer, frankly, is sophisticated enough to have that conversation and instead wants to look to to the outrage. And I, and I agree, it's so transparent why these things happen, and I get so tired of them being rewarded because it's not adding anything substantive or interesting to our conversation. It's just making things more divisive. It actually happened recently over Catherine as well, which is which is going to be released on PS4. It was released on PS4 and Vita in Japan recently where they were saying there was a bunch of transphobia in it based all on these rumors that and it wasn't true. 
And and it's ironic. It's also Atlas. And now you have to create the situation where now the Atlas PR people are like, what the fuck's going on? Now they have to deal with Japan. It's just it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of everybody's time. So whatever. Yeah. I can't get Snooker. <laughs> what are you doing? Snooker. <laughs> Just being weird. Snooka. Snooka. Let's Dude, see. An alienate the entire pond. They love us over there in the, in the UK. Are you kidding me? Dylan Michael wrote into us and said, hello, boys. Hope you're doing good. With Nintendo and Microsoft seemingly having a newfound friendship, what is the biggest move you think they could pull to hurt Sony? I hear rumors of a new and improved Switch. If Microsoft helps Nintendo with the inner workings of the device and allows some more of the exclusives onto it, like they did with Cuphead, I could see it being a noticeable problem for Sony. Thank you for the content. So, Chris, what is the most realistic thing, I guess, that Microsoft and Nintendo could do in a collaboration that would most materially injure Sony and PlayStation as a, as a brand? In my opinion, when you're working with the behemoth, I don't think that there's anything that can take that behemoth down except for the behemoth. I think most cases, like, people people always go back to, like, Haze and, like, Killzone. It's like, these are going to be the Halo killers, you right. know? Yeah, Killzone and, specifically was supposed to be the Halo Yeah, killer, exactly. And Haze, it was horrible. Yeah, no, PS2. exactly. Haze, too, is kind of outright, obviously. Right. But, like... Nothing really killed Halo except for Halo itself. And I think the same thing could be said mm, for the Xbox. And I think I think the Xbox, like the trajectory that, that the 360 was on, was wild. And what ruined it? It wasn't the PS4's great reveal that ruined the Xbox One's reveal. It was, it was the Xbox One's reveal. Like, that's what did, did them in. I think the only thing that could really hurt Sony is Sony at this point. That's I, a great I, point. I don't really think that there's anything that... Microsoft and Nintendo could do to like there's stuff that they could do that could definitely make those platforms more appealing but to hurt Sony I don't know I don't think so it's a really great point though Chris that Microsoft specifically is has done so much to hurt itself and then so much to help itself in a vacuum like it really yeah. I think that it's early stumbles obviously helped PS4 but PS4 has been a runaway train because it's a great console Microsoft I mean, just I mean Sony too like right. in the, with the PS2 the PS2 was huge and then 599 US dollars Ridge Racer Here's this giant enemy crab. Giant enemy, historic, yeah. historically accurate giant enemy yeah, crab, which, is the, which is the best. I just, oh, you know, Kaz, we miss you. Yeah, I mean, those these things tend to just kind of get too big for the britches and then stumble on themselves. Right. And then it allows the competition to to run with it. It reminds me of what Abraham Lincoln said about the United States, that we will undo ourselves, that no one else will be able to, to destroy us. It's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting anecdote, and you're absolutely right, because I think Microsoft's failure, relative failure, and then that's rebound was all done in a vacuum because it had to be done. So it's an interesting thing. Now he asked for re realistic things. I think a realistic thing they can do is have a complete cross publishing partnership, which is possible. I think if that would be wild, I've said this before, if Nintendo puts virtual console on Xbox and then says like the new Mario, the new Zelda, the new are on switch, but you have basically everything else on Microsoft. I think that that's huge. I if think they that that's the, massive. If they put the Master Chief collection on switch. I'm going to blow my, my head's going to explode. That's possible, too. It's going to blow my mind away. I don't think we've seen the last of a really intimate collaboration with these guys. Now, he had mentioned, like, will Microsoft use its expertise to help them make the switch? I, I don't, don't think, think that so. they need to do that. No. What they need to worry about is software. Like, will Xbox Live run on Switch? Will you be able to get achievements on Switch? Will Well, that's uh, the idea, right? Right, exactly. And it's, I wonder... And Nintendo's like, kind of bad with software. <laughs> It's interesting too in Cuphead. Cuphead has an internal achievement system, I noticed, which it probably exists in the in the game on Xbox One. But I Maybe. wonder if this is like a setting too where like the a Xbox Live will read that one day. In other words, I wonder if there's like little subtle things that they're going to do. I really do think that they're going to get intimate together. Now, the, the thing that could happen that's never going to happen that would really hurt Sony is if Microsoft got Nintendo as a third party publisher, right? If they were basically like, Nintendo is going to just put everything on Xbox and everything on Switch and have like these, a handheld, and a console. That would be interesting if Nintendo ended up being Microsoft's foray into handhelds. Right. And then Xbox ended up being Nintendo's foray into high-powered... Consoles. Console. That would be fascinating. Then I think... I could, I could see that happening, but that's really... That's... I don't know. I could see it happening, but at the same time, it seems impossible. It just seems like a massive risk. There is... You know, so if you go back and read about the history of Xbox, I think Microsoft offered to buy Nintendo like a really long time ago. I think like originally when they were making... You know, Microsoft's first console was the Dreamcast. They worked on that console. Yeah. Because uh, Windows CE was running on it. And they had a lot of know-how in the late 90s and were kind of putting feelers out. I mean, the whole relationship with Nintendo when they later bought Rare was from this kind of early talks that they had where they're like, can we buy you? Can you make our console? And that goes back a long way, but there's like a friendly kind of cadence there. Whereas with Nintendo and Sony, they go back and they hate each other. So this is another way for N Nintendo and Sony or for Nintendo to get back at Sony by being like, we're going to actually work with your major partner and kind of stab you in the back because that's really compelling. If you have a thing where 
cross po- cross pollination of these two devices. Yeah. Bad news for Sony. Really. That bad. would be wow. This feels like a soap opera almost. <laughs> It's not going to happen, but yeah, because it's the the thing about a collaboration like that is it is way too risky. And since it would be so intimate, that would require probably them sh- literally trading pieces of the company to each other because like where Microsoft will literally own a piece of Nintendo, Nintendo will literally own a piece of Microsoft because it's like that would be such a massive collaboration with incredible downside if it didn't work out that they would need to have stakes in each other's companies for it to work. Yeah, I think it would mostly I think the most we're going to see is probably games coming out on different uh on each other's platforms i think cuphead's the first of many i think you're gonna see yeah i personally think that the next game you're gonna see on switch is halo wars 2 and you guys can take that to the bank on switch yes that's an interesting one i wouldn't expect that they got civ 6 running on when i saw that they got civ 6 running on switch running on it yeah when i saw that i'm like you can obviously get oh yeah okay i didn't know that i didn't know that there were even strategy games on switch so i saw that and i'm well because i'm thinking about the games that make the most sense on the handheld without breaching xbox's wall of exclusivity too much cuphead is not really a big deal that's not a right people aren't gonna go buy an xbox for cuphead and they're probably not gonna go buy one for halo wars so no. i'm just thinking about the games that are like rare replays another one where i'm thinking about games where i'm like these make sense that's probably the next one i think rare and now replay. and rare putting a game on a nintendo platform would be very interesting too yeah it's first one i guess since about 20 years i would say yeah, yeah. let's see chris next up is austin kohler he writes in and says, what's up, boys? I'm currently playing through the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, and to my dismay, the music has been altered. There is a bit of a disconnect when playing it because of it. I sunk so many hours into the games as a kid that my brain keeps reminding me that the music isn't matching up. My question is, how do you feel about remastered games removing or changing key elements like music? And Chris, CTR is just around the corner, and its music will its music uh, will most likely, he wrote this weird, but he says most likely will be different. Will that bother you? Uh, well, they confirmed that they're going to have the original music in as a toggle, so... I'm not too concerned. Is about that, that not available in the Insane Trilogy? No, that's interesting. No, which is I think that's probably a point of criticism that they learned from. Or they're like, hey, we should probably do that because it wasn't in that thing. But I don't know. I, I think um, when you're remastering something, you have kind of you ca- you kind of have an obligation to stay as true to the source material as possible without necessarily marring all the magic. But I don't know. It didn't it didn't bother me too much with the Insane Trilogy. I figured it was going to sound a little bit different. But at the same time, those Crash Bandicoot games I have a huge uh, connection to, but. My favorite Crash Bandicoot is a team racing game. <laughs> like like those platformers were just kind of like, oh, these are fun. You know, even right, back right. when I was a kid, I liked them a lot, but like they weren't my favorite. I, I, I wasn't holding them to any like super high esteem. Team racing is another thing. So I'm glad that I, I am happy that uh, they're keeping the music. But I, I do feel you. I understand that that would get on my nerves if it was something that I really was passionate about. Right. I think Mr. Kohler is right in the sense that, you know, and Chris had said it, that it looked like, you know, Activision or whoever learned that lesson from the music not being in the insane trilogy. And so they put in CTR. I'm of the mind and you've brought this up in the past, Chris, I think maybe we were talking about medieval. So it's really your idea, but this notion that why wouldn't the original game just be embedded in whatever remake or re-release you have? Like, why wouldn't you just give the person the option to literally just play the original game? So maybe you won't be able to toggle the music on the new game, but you can just go play the old one if you want. I never really understood why you wouldn't just do that and why crash bandicoot wasn't just play like, Crash Bandicoot, the original one, was literally running the entire game in Uncharted 4, right? Like, they had to actually emulate it there. That was the thing that they had to go through, and it was a problem. You would think that if they went through that trouble, then you would at least want to emulate the games to play natively on PS4 within that collection. Yeah, I I, I think part of it is just that the code is so old. And I think, like, just, like, resolution upscaling is actually, like, a, a big thing. Like, there was a whole... I remember... I know a lot about this, about just, like, when they were talking about, like, remastering Halo 2. How, like, even just the jump from... 720 or 480 or whatever the hell the resolution was to 720 or 1080 just fucked with a bunch of shit just because the pixel space and the pixel density was just really important to map design and stuff like that is like i could understand why why games that are that old maybe have a rough time just having a toggle uh but i do like the way that some remasters do it where you can toggle back and forth between new graphics and old graphics i think that's that's super cool that's the ideal way to have a remake but that's not gonna be the case for a lot of these older games right well, these so, codes are just kind of, I don't even know where half the, half of them are. Anyway. Yeah, the people that wrote these engines and these codes are probably not even in the industry anymore, some of them. Yeah. Or dead. Ben Peace wrote in <laughs> and said, as a PS4 to PC convert, Xbox's transition from console to platform has been very apparent. With the introduction of the Master Chief Collection to Steam and having all exclusives coming to PC as well, I'm doing something I've never thought possible, planning on spending money on Xbox branded games. 
Do you think the strategy will be a winner for Microsoft? And conversely, do you think it is something PlayStation is likely to take up as well? So the question here, Chris, in relation to the one we met, said earlier, Ben wants to know, with him being so intrigued by buying Xbox branded games for the first time because of their, their new ubiquity, could you see PlayStation doing the same thing? I personally don't see it happening. Mm -mm. I think that they're going to continue to experiment by releasing certain games on PC, but none of the big guns. And I, I think it's just something you have to do when you're in more of a losing position. But again, like we said earlier, it is very attractive yeah. what, what they're doing. Their install base is going to explode because of this. And I think it's, it's smart. And I think it's an interesting strategy. And I, it's going to be wild. To see how that how that transitions into the next generation of hardware, because I think ultimately people who are interested in hardware will always get the hardware. I have a PC, a PC that can run crazy, crazy great graphics and like crazy good games, at like really high frame rates, high resolutions. I'm still gonna get this next Xbox. I'm still gonna get this next PlayStation because I like the console experience. It's it's interesting. I, I'm I'm pumped to see what, where this leads. I don't see Sony doing it. No, I don't either. I think that that would be a mistake because they've created such a patched up sealed off ecosystem that's just working right now and again as we've said many times while they've experimented releasing some mobile games and they've released a few pc games i, I just don't see it happening I, I but at the same time with with halo infinite i can't think of a better advertising and or advertisement than master chief collection like just yeah what's a better advertisement than that the unfortunate thing for them is that well maybe it's not because they just want to sell games but it's not really a great advertisement for their console since infinite will be playable on pc right so it really is just a uh, it's but that's just, the thing it's like they don't have to Consoles are so expensive to make, but like, and a lot of the draw is like getting an exclusive on that console to get people to buy the console. But if your exclusive is available everywhere, you're getting a ton more money anyway. And people who are going get to the, get the console are going to get the console anyway. So your install base is just already kind of covering a huge cost of that. Right. It's true. It's kind of wild. The interesting thing is, is that they'll get 30% on Steam for, or I'm sorry, 70% on Steam for the game. They'll get 100% of the sales on Xbox One because they don't have to split it with anybody. Yeah. I wonder so if they have a deal. They might. With, with Valve. They might. Hmm. Sawyer McKay wrote into us and said, hey, fellas, I was wondering if there's a type of gameplay or certain core mechanics that will totally spoil you on a game. For example, time trial stressed me the heck out. I was keen on getting the Spider-Man Platinum until I realized I would have to three star all the Taskmaster challenges due to poor management of in-game resources. That almost happened to me, too. Oh, I like time trial. <laughs> that really almost happened to me. Like, because you, you don't have to 100% the Taskmaster no. stuff to get a Platinum. But if you misspend the stuff that you have, then you have to do them. And, that, and I almost did it. It was very close. I like just realized in the nick of time. I'll probably never go back to it. Similarly, I won't touch Majora's Mask with a 10 foot pole because the whole game, as far as I understand, revolves around doing stuff with a time limit. That's oh, true. that's the best Zelda. What are you doing? I agree with you. Has anything similar ever tainted either of your experiences with an otherwise enjoyable game or killed your enthusiasm for one you would have played? No, I love all video games equally. <laughs> This is an interesting one. Like, yeah. I actually hear him. So the Spider-Man Platinum is, is relatable. I have it, but I almost lost out because of Taskmaster as well. But the thing that turns me off the most, Chris, is like when you have this really arbitrary shit in a video game where like it's a third person action shooter or something. And then suddenly you have to race or like it's a, a first person. Like we talk about Titanfall 2, right? I, the only plan, the only trophy I'm missing in that game is the one where you have to run on the wall in that like sequence, that that training sequence, because it's fucking impossible. All right, I just can't. I'm sure, I can do it. I, but I can't let you. I have to I'll do it do myself. It. I don't. You have to do it. I can't do it. I'll I can't donate you my. Plan. <laughs> but so that's the kind of stuff I don't like. Disruptive things, not only in terms of trophies, but in terms of gameplay. Like if you're a third person shooter, just do that really well. I don't need yeah. to have like you know a, a carnival mini game or something like that. Or if you're like a, a Red Dead Redemption. That was really perfect because everything felt good. The horse ride, back riding felt good. Running around felt good and all that kind of stuff. A little stiff, but I just hate when games feel like they, you know, you're playing this game. Now, sudden, Spyro is a fucking great example. Last year, you're playing Spyro. It's a really fun platform. And now suddenly you're playing Knights in the Dreams, you know, because you're going yeah. through these like different. It's like, what is this? Yeah, it's a, it's a mini game game. Right. Spyro. Or like a uh, Arkham Arkham Knight with the with the Batmobile. Yeah, ex it's exactly right. That really that's a great example of something where I'm like, this isn't good compared to the core game. You know, I'm really ADD with with this kind of thing. Like I think, uh, and I know that's like well, whatever. Yeah, but I think uh, if a game can't grab me and hold me in the in the first like ten minutes, I'm I I have a hard time getting back into it. Monster Hunter was like that. It was like the, the tutorial for Monster Hunter World was so long and slow and bland and irritating that I just, I, I, I know that that's a good game. I cannot bring myself to get through it because the tutorial is just so bafflingly annoying. And so like any tutorial section that's, that's like needlessly annoying, like Cuphead, like I couldn't right. get past it. Oh my God. I, I was funny when I was playing the <laughs> Cuphead tutorial, I was just like, I'm like, man, Dean Takahashi uh, really was struggling with this part of the game. Now, the one, th the one design 
I have a lot of little design things that I hate in video games that I've oh, discuss, yeah, I discussed sure a lot of them. Does. But the one thing I do hate is when you're introducing core mechanics into a game. If you're more than 10% through a game, I don't want to fucking learn anything else. Like, the, I need to now know how to play the game. And now you need to go away. Like, games that are literally... Actually, Arkham City was a great example of this. Red Dead did this a lot, actually. Yeah, it, it did. Where, although that's a huge game, but it did do that. But, yeah. like, I hate when it's like, man, it's like you're 30 hours in and now I'm going to teach you something new. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, just just go away. I, I want I want to know these things in the beginning of the game. Figure out clever ways for me to, to integrate them into the gameplay so I understand and learn them and then leave. I don't ever want to see you again when you're if you're introducing shit that late into a game halfway through a game or something. It's like, what? That's just bad design, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's fair. Whether it ruins the game entirely or not, it's a different story, but it is bad design. Final question. Chris comes from Marty Boys. He said, what do you think the odds are of getting some Vita games ported to either PS4 or PS5 now that the Vitas are no longer being produced? This is an interesting question because a lot of games are going to be stranded on that on that hardware. My understanding is that Sony Bend was at one time porting Golden Abyss from Vita to PS3, and then they stopped. This was before Days Gone was in development. And so I think that there are certain games that need to be brought, brought over. And what would be really cool is if Sony, and, and Sony won't do this because it's too cool, but what would be really cool is if Sony was literally like, we have a Vita collection, like in two years, right? Um, when PS5 comes out or PS4, maybe it's playable on both. We have a collection of the 10 brightest spots of the Vita collection from the first party family. We got Killzone on there. We have Uncharted. We have Freedom Wars and, you know, whatever, you know, Soul Sacrifice, all these games that you really enjoyed. Now they're all fully playable on PS4 as of O to the Vita. You know, a lot of your guys' Vitas are dying. You know, you don't have them. I think that would be really <laughs> great, you know, but yeah. I, I really highly doubt that's going to happen. But I do think that there are certain a few games that will definitely come over at some point. They're not going to strand Golden Abyss on Vita forever. There's no way. It's an Uncharted game. I just can't imagine that they're just going to be like, yeah, you have to play v a core canon Uncharted game on Vita. I just don't think that they're going to do that. Same with Killzone. Same with all these other games. They actually are within the continuity. And so I wonder if they'll just strand them there or not. I, I doubt it. I don't have as much faith as that. I think they're going to stay stranded on them. I think they kind of want to forget the Vita happened. If I'm being honest. The, the way they treated it seems... <laughs> pretty apparent there's so much resentment internally towards it it's so funny to me like yeah. why would you resent it so much? there is a lot of inter i mean i know a lot of people that work there and there is a lot of internal tension there was over Vita, over how much you should talk about it how much pr should make it accessible the the main one of the major mistakes a lot of people don't know this probably is that vita dev kit vitas were never sent to any media and we couldn't use them so it was the only console at the time when i was at ign that we had we didn't have a dev kit for and so sony used to have to come in with a special vita and let us play it and just sit there all day and we would play it and capture footage off of it because you couldn't capture direct feed off of a normal Vita. There was there's still no solution for it with the exception of PS Vita TV. So they've always just put it behind the eight ball. Like even when I wanted to cover it, it had to be this whole thing where like, all right, now we got to send someone to your office full of all of these games and we're going to sit there all day. It's like you could have just sent me a dev kit. And the other funny thing is that a lot of publishers didn't know we didn't have dev kits. So they'd send us early copies of games, but not on card. They would send them on CDs assuming like on CDs, like Blu-rays, assuming that you we have the dev kits hooked into PCs where you rip it off of the thing and put it on the Vita. I'm like, I don't think you guys understand. We don't have this. Yeah. So then they would send us a little. Yeah, cards. I don't know. I, I I don't I don't foresee that a Vita collection. I really think it's like one of those things that they just want to forget. I don't foresee it, but I it would be nice. And I do think I do believe 100 percent that there are just a few games on there that they just will eventually get off of it. I, I don't know. They already did it with Tearaway because it's on PS4. But I just I just find I have a hard time grappling with like a core kill zone and a core, a core Uncharted game being stranded on Vita. But well, they're on Vita, so they're not core. I think that's the kind of um, the, the mentality behind it. I think it's like these aren't core games because they're not on the core platform. Right. That's true. They're canon, but not core. That's true. There is a difference. Yeah. Chris, that's all I have. Yeah. Well, that was a heavy PS5 week. Heavy PS5 flow. Yeah. As it were. <laughs> Uh, but we enjoyed it very much. I, I hope you guys all enjoyed the show as well. I do want to throw this out there, by the way. I'm going to talk about this more in depth next week because I forgot to research it based on all the things that have been happening. But I think we missed some things on the Respawn Star Wars announcement that I want to go back to. So did we'll we? do that next week. Yeah, I think we did. Hmm, so I right. want to go back to that. I meant to put that into this week. I was thinking about it about halfway through, but I want to acknowledge that because I think we there's just certain details that we just missed that are that are germane to the game. Jermaine. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Good word. Thank you. Jermaine Clement is a man. He is. Now, we'll get to that next week. We will obviously have two episodes. Like in the next week or so, we'll have our normal core episode, but also a Days Gone specific episode. 
that will be rife with spoilers. So only I will warn you, but only listen to it when you're ready. I'm excited. I'm excited too. I, mean, I have lots to say about it. I really do want to give Sony a shout out, and I'm going to do this again when we talk about it in a review, but really give them a shout out. They gave us this game very early. They gave everyone the game very early. Yeah. And it's really given us a lot of time to explore it and sit with it and not have to play it crazily. The NHL playoffs are going on right now, so that's been a huge distraction for me. So it's just been really nice to not have five days to cruise and cruise this game. So shout out to Sony PR for that. Yeah, for sure. Chris, do you have anything else to say? Uh, no, I'm sick and I want to sleep. You're always sick. It's just, just let me know when you, it's more rare it's when this you're well. Year, it's like, I'm like, I've been back to back sick for some reason. I was fine. Like most of the last, like several, I think because it started raining again and now there's pollen in the air. Right. Now all the plants are healthy. So I have to suffer back to back sickness champion. I'm sick of Chris the plants. Regan. Get rid of the sand. Get rid of plants in general. We don't need them. It's Earth Day when we're recording this. Oh, <laughs> some people got mad. Some people got mad. But some people got mad at me because I said the Earth's I tweeted out the Earth's going to die. Do what feels good. Like, that's like a real comp, like a real comment. Yeah, yeah. People well, are like, well, don't, people don't are like just, oh, this ain't it, man. I'm like, yeah, well, no, well, don't really, just, really don't just go out in your backyard, like burn like an effigy of plastic bottles. But like, you know, try and, you know, try to be mindful. Hang out, though. Don't 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 stress too much. Don't, yeah, don't stress it out too much. Don't be an asshole, though. No, <laughs> no, there's nothing. We, there's, don't shove a plastic straw into the into a seal. You the, know, the thing about global warming is that there's nothing we can do about it. So don't let it don't let it stress you out too much. We I'm only die. kidding. I'm only being totally physician. <laughs> Chris, I appreciate your time. Hope you're doing well. I'll see you next week. We'll talk to all of you next week as well. We look forward to the next episode of the Days Gone discussion and all of the rest. We hope you're doing well. Thank you so much for your love, kindness, and support. Remember to support the show on Patreon. If you can't, leave us nice reviews. Tell your friends and family. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Take care, guys. <laughs> I'm dying. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is fan-supported over at patreon.com slash Collins Last Stand. The following names are at the producer level or higher on Patreon. And I want to thank you from the very bottom of my heart for your incredible kindness and generosity. Carlos Algarit, Eric Alley, CJ Anderson, George Anthony Nunez, Morgan Ashley, Sean Battershaw, Martin Beck, Michael Betts, Eric Bishop, Mark Boggio, Eli Bosford, Barrett Boswell, Spencer Brand, Miguel Brewer, Lennon Brixey, Matthew Brousseau, Josh Bushing, Austin Bullock, Andrew Burkhart, Dylan Burns, Chris Buston, Alex Cabrera, Brian Cacciatolo, Will Caldwell, Patrick Harper, William O'Carroll, Ryan Caulfield, Brian Chan, Travis Chandler, Sean Chandler, David Chestnut, Simon Conception Jr., Brad Cooley, Geo Corsi, Cutter Crow, Nick Cummings, Daniel D'Amour, Colin Davenport, Daniel Delanikos, Mitchell Durkash, Knight Draft, David Ellis, Martha Emery, Joe Finelli, Eric Finkenbeiner, Candler Four, Fodios Frangos, Michael Gallier, Chris Galvin, Connor Gassian, Alex Gates, Michael Gates, Salem Gotham Algonham, Toothless Gibbon, Daniel Glassford, Tyler Goodwin, Josh Gravelick, Miranda Grubba, Tyler Harris, Kyle Hagel, Wyatt Henry, Asa Haas, Azan Isa El Ricey, Josh Yeager, John Jameson, Joshua Jonathan, Greg Juleps, N. K., Jeremy Key, James Kinslow the Third, Ryan R. Kittredge, Jackson Lastiqua, Donald Laws, Joe Lawson, Don Q. Lee, Patrick Leslie, Dustin Lewis, Keith Adrian Lewis, Chad Lewis, Lou and Ray Loper, Elijah Lopez, Colin Love, Josh M., Ryan T. Mandel, Peter Mark, Michael Martinez, Sean Mason, Zachariah McAdoo, John McCarthy, Joe McPartland, Dennis Meinchin, Andrew Mendoza, Christopher Midling, Albert Miranda, Patrick Malloy, Betty Ann Moriarty, Abe Mukhtar, Ryan Murdoch, Brian Nietzsche, Adam Nix, Donnie Nolan, Brian Ott, Jorge Palomino, Todd Paxton, Brendan Peavy, Marius S. Peterson, Enrique Perez, Nicholas Perfect, James Perone, Eric A. Peterson, Jason Pettit, Jeff Pollard, Louis Powell, Lawrence F. Prokop, Ryan Reeves, Michael Renner, Peter Reynolds, Shane Rayum, Jonathan Rice, Mark Richardson, Toby D. Riemenschneider, Petro Rose, A.G. Rowe, John Scholes, Chris Schaefer, Michael Shanholtz, Brandon Sharkey, Toby Schutman, Glennon Cole Simper, Joshua Smallwood, Andrew Smith, Daniel Strycharsk, John Tamanillo, Ahmad Tamar, Joseph Thayer, Ben Thompson, Carl Tolman, Tam Tran, Alan Tremblay, Raymond Joshua Vargas, Michael Vecchio, Oakley Waldron, Justin Wagaman, Isaac Wastman, Damon Weathers, Mike Wayant, Corey Wyatt, Tony Zaniga, Hugo's Desk, Casual Misfits Gaming, Supershot ST, Throw7, Infinite, Homeworld Hub, Mad Mock Media, Fabian, Mubarak, Richter86, That Rescue Guy, Andrew, Ian, Chris, Donk2015, and Gavin.